This is an introduction to taping in the context of surveying methods. If you have not already done so, please print the document that is available online that accompanies this video and you can fill in the blanks in that document as we go. We need to start with a history of distance units. In many cultures over several hundred years there have been a variety of ways, a variety of units used for expressing distances. The one that's most relevant to us in this discussion today is what we call the rod. <clears throat> this was used in England as early as 1066 and depending on the, the um, subculture uh, you were paying attention to at the time, um, the Saxon name for this was either a rod or a gird. And then you'll hear other names for the rod as well. Often it's called a pole, which in English, a pole and a rod are roughly synonymous. Or you may also hear the term perch, which is an adaptation of a French name. This 16 and a half foot rod was usually a wood rod or pole of that length, which was useful for measuring horizontal distances, but it had certain limitations in measuring distances on sloping ground. So the Gunter's chain was developed by uh, a man named Edmund Gunter in 1620. Edmund Gunter was a philosopher, a mathematician, an inventor, a physicist, a scientist, and he understood the, the value of having something much more portable and flexible, but even more reliable than the standard uh, rod of 16 and a half feet. This chain, as we commonly call the Gunter's chain, was commonly used from about the early 1700s into the early 1900s. And the chain is actually four rods long, and if you take four times 16 and a half, that works out to be 66 feet. Well, that 66 feet becomes very significant as you look into the history of distance units here in the United States. The chain is really a chain of links of wire, made of wire, and there are 100 links in this chain. Well, thus the links become the minimum unit, the the smallest unit in this distance measuring device. If you measured a distance of four chains and twelve links, well, think about that, those links being a decimal part of a chain, four chains, twelve links is 4.12 chains. The chain was thought of as a basic unit of measurement. They didn't think so much in feet, they thought in terms of rods and chains. The Gunter's chain that you see on your handout and in this image here doesn't have feet or links numbered, but what you have at every tenth link you will see a tag. Let me highlight those for you this tag has one point on it. That means it is 10 links from the end, and the end of the chain is actually the far end of each handle that you see down here at the bottom of the image. This tag is at 20 links from the end. This one has three points. It's 30 links from the end. There's 40 links from the end. And the middle one is what we often call the ball tag because it is round. And then it counts back down 40, 30, 20, 10 links from the end. So therefore, this is really a bidirectional chain, isn't it? So in order to measure links, as we said before, four chains and 12 links, the chaining crew would have to 
keep track of which tag uh, they had just noticed and then count links. Do you suppose it's easy to miscount? Well, absolutely. And that was a common error source in the use of the Gunter's chain. Well, the Gunter's chain was the basis for a mile. Let's think about this. 80 chains laid end to end, that would be 80 chains times 66 feet per chain equals 5,280 feet. You see, the chain is the basis of the mile. Perhaps you have heard of legal descriptions of land, especially agricultural land that is described as the east 20 chains of a certain parcel. Well, that's what they're referring to. So thus, we break a mile down into smaller parts. Well, an eighth of a mile is a half of a quarter, which is a half of a half, which is a half of the whole. Well, 10 chains is 660 feet. A quarter mile, 1,320 feet. Why? Because 20 is 20 multiples of 66 feet per chain. Perhaps you've heard the term one furlong. Well, that's an eighth of a mile. That's 10 chains. And that unit is something that is specific to horse racing. The significance of the 66-foot chain can be seen in aerial photos of the Midwest. In fact, you can the Midwest and the Western states, you can see uh, land that has been divided into one mile by one mile squares, like we're outlining uh, here. Okay, this would be. Let's find it all. This would be one mile by one mile. Well, how were those lines laid out? Back in the 18, early 1800s, when Illinois was being divided into these one mile by one mile sections, they were using the 66 foot Gunter's chain. So I think you could imagine someone was out here walking these distances and laying that chain end to end 80 times to go one mile. Well, there are some important relationships. One square mile, then, is 80 chains by 80 chains. They weren't thinking in feet back then. They were thinking in chains. Well, then, if we do the math, 80 times 80 gives us 6,400 square chains. Well, the, the relationship of square miles to acres was fixed by this relationship here. 10 square chains is one acre. That's like saying one a, a strip of land that is one chain by ten chains. The dimensions are one by ten. That is ten square chains. Well, <clears throat> a square mile then, if I do the math, would be 60, 640 acres. 6,400 square chains divided by ten square chains per acre gives me 640 acres. Well, then if I consider this standard section is divided into quarters, well, we we can then do the math. You see a quarter of 640 by 600 or excuse me, a quarter of 80 chains by 80 chains would have dimensions of 40 chains by 40 chains, right? 40 times 40 chains gives me what? 1,600 square chains? Well, if I divide that by 10, I get 160 acres, which you also know 160 is one quarter of 640. These things break down even further. So I think you can understand 40 acres is now one quarter mile or 20 chains by 20 chains. This is a quarter mile from there to there, isn't it? And these can break up even further. But now if you're ever wondering how big is 40 acres, it's a quarter mile by quarter mile or 20 chains by 20 chains. Well, the Gunter's chain, as it grows older, gets longer. How is that? 
Well, think about dragging it through the soil, dragging it through sand, and little particles of sand get between the links where the metal rubs on metal, where the links join together, and the abrasive soil wears away the metal. Well, as the metal wears away in that contact area, gradually over time, the chain gets longer. And thus, that produces a systematic error. These chains stretched due to abrasion in the links. So the systematic error would require correction. That is, uh, for instance, I was I had the honor of retracing a survey uh, done by Abraham Lincoln himself. He laid out the town of Petersburg, Illinois, in 1836. And I had to measure between several boundary corners that apparently he had set. Therefore, I was able to determine after the fact that his chain was actually about a half a foot longer than its original 66-foot length. But think about this. That chain is 66 feet long. It has 100 lengths. If I take 66 divided by 100, that means each link is 0.66 feet long. If you convert that to inches, then that is 8 inches. A half a foot, 6 inches. So his half a foot error was smaller than the minimum unit with which they would measure with the Gunter's chain. So his error was generally acceptable at that time. However, if a chain got long enough that it was a whole link too long, they would clip off a link. But now you have a 99 foot, 99 link chain, don't you? And that requires some, some serious thought to get accurate distances. We still feel this impact today in our boundary surveys. Like I said, when I retraced Lincoln's survey, I found that his chain was a half a foot longer than it was originally. Therefore, if I had to restore a distance according to his survey, I had to restore it according to his chain, but not necessarily according to my measurement. The Gunter's chain was effectively made obsolete by the steel tape in the early 1900s. Why is that? Well, it was in the early 1900s that our understanding of metallurgy allowed manufacturers to make spring steel tapes, that is, a steel tape that could flex and would only break in very extreme conditions. So prior to that time, we didn't have the ability to make spring steel because our understanding of metals alloying had not advanced far enough. Today, we use a handful of different things to measure distances, and one of the one that you will handle in very short order here will be the six foot wood ruler. The ruler that you see here, if you look carefully at it, is graduated in tenths and hundredths of a foot. On the other side of the ruler, not visible in this photo, you will also see feet and inches. But the majority of the work we do in CIT 113 is certainly going to be using uh, hundredths and tenths of a foot, that is decimal feet. The six foot ruler is very handy for for one person measurement and folds up easily and fits in your back pocket. The fiberglass cloth tape is uh, is a tape, uh, not a metal tape, it, the band is not made of metal, but it is a coated fiberglass fabric and uh, on the coating there are graduations printed along the length of the tape. This is a very handy kind of thing for lower accuracy measurements than we might need via other methods. Uh, tape like this is very versatile and if, if, if it gets broken or torn in two it's not terribly expensive to replace or repair. A steel tape is one that does not stretch as much as a fiberglass tape. Yes, a fiberglass tape can be stretched and it will spring back. A steel tape, you have to work an awful lot harder to stretch it. Yes, you can, but you're not as likely to stretch it and thus you are more likely to get accurate distances, more accurate distances when you use 
proper methodology. You'll certainly be using this in an upcoming lab. We can also use lasers. The laser pictured here is a survey grade laser, a small pocket, uh, pocket portable laser that can bounce a beam off of a distant surface and receive reflected energy at the speed of light, obviously, and then calculate that distance and express it in whatever units you need. I have used one of these many times for doing surveys of the insides of buildings. And then one, the, another one that you will use in this course is called an electronic distance meter. And this is a component built into a total station. As you, the instrument that you see on the tripod in in the image on the right is called a total station and one of the integral components of that is an electronic distance meter. Most of them use infrared light, that is light that you cannot see, it's not on the physical, visible spectrum, but we will bounce an infrared light signal from that instrument that you see the instrument here on the left it leaves the emitter in the instrument, travels to a reflector, which you will see soon, and then the reflector bounces the emitted signal back to the instrument where the receiver collects that infrared light energy, and thus we measure the distance from the total station to the reflector using reflected uh, we're going to use steel taping to help you learn some basic concepts of error management. And there are things that cause errors in steel taping. One of the first ones is temperature. I think you understand by now that as things heat up, many objects, many materials, as they heat up, they expand. And as they get cold, they shrink. Well, a steel tape is the same way. As the tape heats up, it gets longer. As it cools, it gets shorter. Thus, we have to understand what the temperature is if we want to get a very accurate reading using a steel tape. The tension in the tape and the sag in the tape also have an impact. I think you understand if if you have a hundred foot steel tape and you have to hold it up so none of it is touching the ground then then it's going to have a sag in the middle and that sag pulls the ends of the tape closer together that's an error source but the tension can help eliminate some of that sag can't it but the tension can also cause stretch in the tape Taping on a slope. Well, that makes sense because I think you understand if you want a horizontal distance, but you tape on a slope surface, then the slope distance is longer than the horizontal distance, isn't it? Okay. So we have to come up with ways to compensate for slope. We also have to talk about alignment. I think you can understand that if I am taping from here to here and I and I tape in this direction for 100 feet and this direction for 100 feet and this direction for 100 feet and I wander all over the place then my measurement will be longer than the truth won't it so we have some limits to how much misalignment we can have marking perhaps you've heard the adage that says something like, oh, we're going to measure with a micrometer, we're going to mark with chalk, and we're going to cut with an axe, right? That seems to indicate lesser and lesser precision at each step of the way. Well, if we measure very well, but we mark poorly, that is an error source. And then the tape length. The tape length is not as much of an issue as it used to be, but... Uh, it is possible to break a tape. Okay, So when we would repair, years back, when we would repair a tape by splicing, well, is it possible that the spliced length is a little bit different than the original length? Well, absolutely. This isn't as much of an issue these days because 
it, because of the price of tapes, if we break a tape, we're more likely to replace it than we are to splice it. Well, all of these error sources that you can see listed here, temperature, uh, tension, slope, alignment, marking, and length, if we keep the impact of those to within certain limits, then we can minimize their effect on one tape length worth of measurement. And when we do it this way, we get what we call 1 in 5,000 accuracy. This is a ratio, 1 to 5,000. That is one part error to 5,000 parts measurement. Okay, This is like saying, if I measure and keep my slope errors no more than 1 foot per 100 feet, and all these other characteristics, then my error in a 5,000 foot measurement will be no greater than one foot. That's one foot error in 5,000 feet measurement. And to achieve that, I need to adhere to these standards. And we're going to teach you how to do that. If you have had a little bit of statistics, then what we can find is the sum of the effects of these errors works out to be about two hundredths of a foot. This rounds to point zero two, doesn't it? It's about two hundredths of a foot in about 5,000 feet, a little bit more than that. So that's our goal. If we measure something twice and we measure it at 100.01 and we measure the same distance at 99.99 feet, I have a distant difference of 0.02 feet. And that difference in the two readings satisfies a 1 in 5,000 accuracy standard. That is two hundredths of a foot in 100 feet works out to be one in 5,000 accuracy. Well, when you purchase a tape of the type that we are going to use that we call a, um, this is what we call a highway tape, that is really well, we refer to it in those terms. Really, the manufacturer calls it HI-WAY, highway tape. <clears throat> this type of tape is certified at 68 degrees Fahrenheit, at 10 pounds of tension, and at a fully supported condition to be exactly 100.00 feet long. Okay? That's the type of tapes we will use in this lab. Steel tapes, because they change length with temperature, cause us to correct our readings for temperature. So we're going to use a formula spelled out this way. C sub T here stands for the correction that we're going to apply to our distance. And then we have in here a coefficient or a constant. And that coefficient is what we call the coefficient of linear expansion for our steel tape. That coefficient gets multiplied times a temperature difference. That difference is between the temperature at the time of measurement and 68. Well, where did we 60, see 68 before? Well, 68 degrees is the standard temperature under which the tape was calibrated. And then L is the measured length. This could be less than 100 feet, or it could be many multiples of 100 feet. Well, I think you can understand here, if I have 
a value of, say, 78 degrees here at T, then, then that will give me a positive result inside the parentheses, correct? Whereas if this was 58 degrees, then I'll have a negative result in the parentheses, right? Thus, the final result, C sub T, can be either positive or negative. And we'll apply that carefully. Well, there are going to be two different scenarios in which we apply a steel tape correction. One is where we measure between existing points. Okay, We're measuring between points that already exist. So what we'll do is we'll take our measured distance and we will add the correction, whatever we come up with. Now this correction, we could be, we said it could be positive or negative, couldn't it? When, when we do this, our result will be the actual distance. But if we have one point and we're laying out a new point, that is, we're creating a new line. We're laying out a new distance. Okay. Then the same three terms that we see up here show up down here, but in different places. We have simply solved an equation for a different variable. Notice measure distance was up here above the sum line. Now it's down here below the sum line, and now it's a difference line, isn't it? See, we're taking the actual distance minus the correction. Remember, the correction could be positive or negative. Remember that? And thus, we'll get the distance that we have to measure in order to lay out our new location. Well, I want to work through a couple of examples with you. And the first one is a basic one that is going to give us a rule of thumb. That is, first, we have two points, two existing points that are measured 100 feet apart on an 83 degree Fahrenheit day. So let's find the actual distance. All right, we said... We said C sub T equals this coefficient times T minus 68 times the length. Well, in this case, the length we're talking about is 100 feet, and T is 83 degrees Fahrenheit, right? So if I plug this in, CT times 83 minus 68 times 100. I can simplify this, can't I? This becomes a positive 15 degrees, doesn't it? Well, if I do the math, then I'm going to find out that this rounds to a positive... 0 0.01 feet. Okay? So what we're saying is every time you change 15 degrees, a 100 foot tape will change length by 100. This could be a positive 15 or a negative 15, couldn't it? If I change by 30 degrees either way, my distance is changing by two hundredths. If my if it's a if I'm 30 degrees colder than 68, then my correction is negative, isn't it? A negative two hundredths for every hundred foot length. Okay, so that fits this rule of thumb: a 15 degree Fahrenheit temperature change produces a hundredth of a foot length change in a 100 foot steel tape. You can use this rule of thumb to mentally estimate what a correction would be should you need to use this. 
So we want to do two more exa- or four more examples here. Let's work them out briefly, and I encourage you to follow along. All right, we have two existing points. So which are we going to use? Existing points or laying out? I'm making the simple on you. We have two existing points. So in this case, we're going to say measured distance plus correction is going to give us actual distance, correct? All right. So let's go ahead then and work this. You have some space in your handout, and I'll work it with you. We said, we said CT equals this times T minus 68 times L. Okay, L we said is what? Per the handout, it's 3710.16 and T is 84 degrees Fahrenheit. This is in feet, isn't it? Okay, so as I work it out, looks like this. Um, 84 minus 68 is, what, 16 degrees? That's a positive 16 times 3710.16 feet. So when I do the math here, when I crunch this out on my calculator, bear with me. One, two, three, four, five, six, four, five. Times, what do we say? 16 times 3710.16. I get a positive 0 0.38. And I'm going to carry it out to one more place but then round back later. This is my correction. Okay? This is my correction. So I'm going to take my measured distance. My measured distance was 3710.16 feet plus a positive 0 0.383 feet. And I'm going to round my result to the nearest hundredth of a foot that's nearest point oh one so I'm going to get three seven ten point five four feet three seven ten point five four feet this is my actual distance isn't it that is my by my tape I read 37.10.16. My tape was too long, wasn't it? It was 84 degrees. However, when the tape is long, it actually reads short. You have to think about that one a little bit. When the tape is long, it reads short. It read shorter than actual. And that makes sense because, you see, my actual is longer than what I read. Okay, well, let's move forward. Let's look at the next one. The next one is also an existing point problem. And here we have eight, we have 832.88 feet, right? 832.88 feet. And we have, oh, okay, now we're cold, aren't we? Our temperature is 34 degrees Fahrenheit. So this sets up this way. That is a 6. And I'm going to have 34 minus 68, which is going to give me, what, a minus 34 degree change, isn't it? Okay. Times 
832.88 feet. So when I crank this out, I'm going to get a negative number, aren't I? And that works out to be a negative 0 0.183 feet. Okay, well, we're still working in existing points. So I'm going to take my measured distance. That was 832.88 feet. Plus, now this is a negative, isn't it? You understand, then, that adding a, a negative number gives us a net subtraction, doesn't it? So, uh, that works out to 832.697, or we'll record that as 832.70. Okay, 832.70 feet. This was measured, this was correction, and this is actual distance. Okay? Two more examples. And this time they are layout examples, so you can see how we apply the other rule. This time we're laying out a distance of 466 feet. So think of it this way. We have some point A, and we need to set some point that is 466.32 feet away from point A. And when we do, we're going to call that point B. We haven't done it yet. You see, we have to measure we have to we have to measure something so we get an actual 466.32 feet but think about this our temperature on this particular day is 41 degrees fahrenheit it's not standard conditions so my tape is shorter isn't it when the tape is short when it has shrunk end to end it's going to read long okay so what I have to do is find out what I need it to read in order to get an actual 466.32. All right, well, I'm going to generate the correction just exactly the same way. The correction process, the correction size, that process doesn't change. So 41 degrees minus 68, that gives us what, a minus 27? And then my length is 466.32 feet. Okay, and then my correction, when I plug it into my calculator, works out to be negative point zero eight one feet okay that rounds to eight hundredths of a foot now consider I'm trying to find what it takes to measure with this actual distance so I'm going to take four sixty six point three two feet that is actual and I'm going to subtract C sub t this time. So now I'm going to subtract this negative number, aren't I? And thus, that's effectively adding, isn't it? I'm subtracting a negative. That's like adding 0 0.08 here. So it works out to be 466.40 feet is what I have to measure in order to get this actual distance. All right, let's illustrate this one more time to help strengthen those skills. In this final problem, 
it's the same thing. It's the same distance, isn't it? We're still going from A to B, and we need to be 466.32 feet actual. But this time, it's a different correction, isn't it? Now, instead of it being in the 40s, it's now in the 90s. A nice August day in central Illinois. 93 minus 68. That's going to give you, what, uh, 80, 88 would be 20, and this would be 25, a positive 25 degrees, and I'm going 466.32 feet. So when I, I get a positive 0 0.075 feet okay and this time I'm taking actual like we said before 466.32 feet minus now it's a positive value isn't it but I'm subtracting that positive value, and this time, well, it's like subtracting um, subtracting eight hundredths of a foot. We'll go ahead and call that eight hundredths. So that's going to put me at four six six point two four feet, isn't it? This is what I will measure to get four sixty six actual. So on two different days, I could go out there trying to get 466.32 and I'd have to hold two very different values on my tape in order to create an actual distance of 466.32. I hope this has been helpful for you and this you may find this very useful for preparing for homework or quizzes or tests. Thanks.